So this is the Radian Model 1, and this is the most expensive AR-15 that I've ever tested before. But that pricing might be for good reason, because this gun is the best performing gun on the full auto burndowns from the Golden Web YouTube channel. We'll get more into that here in a little bit. Now, typically when we start seeing AR-15s that are in the higher end price bracket like this one, they usually come in two different flavors. The first type are usually Gucci'd out, they're in a a lot of crazy colors and they have a lot of accessories and upgrades on them that don't really have a real practical benefit they are usually made for like competition style shooting and stuff like that think of companies like black rain ordnance or f1 firearm now the downside to those guns is not only do they look kind of cringe but they typically don't hold up to a lot of abuse because those companies typically put the majority of their budget for those rifles into gaudy upgrades instead of investing that money in better qc and better manufacturing processes the second type we usually see are a little bit more bland looking than the Gucci'd out versions, but these are typically more battle proven. These are typically guns that come from companies that have government contracts of some kind. Think of companies like Geisley, LMT, Knights Armament, and Daniel Defense. Aside from the Geisley rifles, most of these guns typically have basic mil-spec controls, basic mil-spec triggers, and they're not typically sub-MOA. <laughs> now, if you've watched any of my videos from the past when I've reviewed higher end AR-15s, my goal is to figure out and understand why they are priced the way they are. I want to know where they invested the money into the gun because in some cases, some manufacturers price their guns the way they are and then you get them and they just simply aren't worth the money. Now, in the past few years, we have been seeing a few guns come out from companies that fall in the middle. They're not really Gucci'd out, but they also don't have the basic mil-spec controls and mil-spec triggers. Typically, these companies don't have government contracts, at least for firearms. They usually come from aerospace type companies. A good example of that would be like this guy right here that came from Blackout Defense. I did a video on this one a little over a year ago and I'm not gonna go into all the details on this gun in today's video. I will put a link in the description so you can watch it later after this video, but this thing has a ton of QC and a ton of high-end specs on it that go beyond just your standard government contract style gun, but they're not as gaudy or as cheaply made as some of these Gucci'd out guns that you've seen. And I would say that the Radian Model 1 is very similar to that of the Blackout Defense because it kind of falls in the middle, having all the higher end quality control, the higher end manufacturing processes, but they're also a company that don't really have government contracts. And the reason that government contracts are kind of important or non-important is whenever a company creates a gun for a government entity, whenever they agree on a price for that government entity, they can't sell it to the general public for any less. So that's why the prices kind of are a little bit inflated. However, whenever a company makes a gun that doesn't have a government contract, sometimes their prices are warranted because they're only pricing it that way because of all the extra QC that goes into them. In the case of Radian, I would say that they tend to spend the majority of their budget on the rifle on higher end precise manufacturing as well as quality control. And what that does is it allows them to blend the perfect match of function and form. Now, although Radian doesn't have a military contract, all of their rifles and all of their uppers come with a sub MOA guarantee using Black Hills ammunition. We'll talk more about that here in a little bit. And that's something that most of your government contract guns simply don't offer. I know that the Geisley can shoot sub MOA with the right ammo and the right shooter, but there's no guarantee to it. And then other companies typically don't have a sub MOA guarantee on their guns. And going back to what I was talking about in the beginning of the video, this gun outperformed almost every Every single gun on the Golden Web YouTube channel during the full auto burndown. This gun outperformed companies like Geisley, LMT, Knights Armament, and Daniel Defense by a quite a large margin. Additionally, this was one of only two rifles on their entire channel that actually failed properly. And what I mean by that is on a direct impingement AR-15, we have a gas tube and that gas tube is designed to fail before the barrel fails. And on every single gun, except for the Radian and the Geisley Super Duty, the barrel has pretty much exploded on almost all of them. Not every single one, there's been a couple that didn't explode, but they failed in a different way. But these were the only two that failed properly and these two outperformed every other 
rifle that they've ever tested. Now to put that into perspective, the Radian Model 1 went 1,055 rounds and then the gas tube exploded, which went 55 rounds more than the LMT DI gun. It also went 154 rounds more than the Geisley Super Duty. It went 369 rounds more than Daniel Defense. And it went 481 rounds more than Knight's Armament SR-15. Now, I will say this, most recently, Geisley did come back to them with a different Super Duty upper that they put a prototype barrel and a prototype gas tube on, and that one did go like 1,600 rounds, but that's not a gun that they currently offer. That was just some kind of prototype thing that they were trying to play with to see how far they could make it go. So all of that makes me question, how is it that a smallish company that has limited budgets and no government contracts, how are they able to make a gun that has a sub MOA guarantee and it's outperforming all the big boys? Now, before we get to that, it's very important that you know this. So far in this video, I've been singing Radiant's praises. And with that said, I do have quite a few bones to pick about this one. This one's not perfect in any sense of the imagination. I don't think anything is perfect. And we're gonna talk about some of those bones that I wanna pick with this when we get to the pros and cons section of the video. But I mentioned this because I wanted to let you know what my relationship is with Radian. They sent this out to me to test and review. There was no money exchanged. Some people think if you have something sent to you for to test and review that that makes you biased. And to kind of put that into perspective, Daniel Defense sent me a DDM4 version seven last year and I didn't give it a raving review. You can go check that video out right here if you wanna watch that. I tend to be more biased for things that I actually spend my money on because I don't have any emotional attachment to things that are sent to the channel. Whether you believe me or not, it's totally up to you. I always say in every single video, I think it's best that you go and do more research beyond my video. I think you should watch videos from other YouTubers. I think you should go to Reddit and different Facebook groups and research on what other people's experiences are because at the end of the day, I have a sample size of one and I could have the only one that works or the only one that breaks. Now, although Radian didn't help us out financially with this video, Brownells did. And I bring that up because Brownells does have these and they're pretty much cheaper than everywhere else, which reminds me, I will have a parts list for everything that we talk about in today's video. The easiest way to find that parts list is the first link in the description. I'll also pin that link in the comments section for you as well. And if you're watching this on your television, I'll put a little QR code right here. That way you can browse the parts list while you watch the video. Also real quick, if you guys could do me a huge favor, if you wanna help out any channel here on YouTube, especially in the 2A space, all you gotta do is subscribe to their channel. Because whenever you hit the subscribe button on any video, it'll typically trip the algorithm to start recommending these videos out to an audience that's never been exposed to 2A content before. And I honestly think that that's a fantastic way to kind of get more people onto our side of the 2A conversation. If you could, I'd greatly appreciate it. Now, before we get too far into the specs, I want to show you what all attachments and optics and stuff that I have on here right now, because I know a lot of you guys are going to be wondering. So let's look at that real quick. I'll make sure to have everything available over at the parts list in case you want to check it out. So up here on the front, I got the Streamlight ProTac HLX weapon light along with their pressure switch. I don't have it zip tied on because where I have the switch is actually right where the gas tube is and I don't wanna screw that up. So it's on there really good using their factory attachments. And despite it looking very large, it's actually not as heavy as it looks. Up here for optics, I have the EOTech Voodoo one to 10 scope. This thing is kind of crazy because it's almost daylight bright for the reticle, very close to that. But the interesting thing is for this LPVO, the whole back tube moves. Now this is my first experience with an EOTech LPVO. I do have a video coming out soon on, you know, comparing different LPVOs and stuff, but I'm just not finished with it yet. That's why I haven't published it, but very interesting. It's very expensive, but so far, man, definitely seems to be living up to the hype. For the mount, we've got the Unity Tactical. Um, this is the 2.05 inch height mount. This is a higher mount than I typically use, but I wanted to try it because it seems to be conducive for having your head more vertical when you're shooting. And I have a lot of neck problems. Having my head more vertical just seems to really help me out a lot. On the sides here, I got some rail scales. I just wanted to go with like a gray and FDE type vibe on this gun. I think they contrast very well with one another. Um, for the foregrip, I might change this later. I was just testing it out 
This is the Strike Industries. I forget which one it is, but I'll have it listed over at the parts list. But I only put it on here because it was FDE and it had it laying around, but I might change that in the future. So as of right now, the Radian Model 1 comes in two calibers, 223 Wild and 300 Blackout. However, the 300 Blackout only comes in a nine inch pistol variant or SBR variant. Now, when it comes to the 223 variant, they have a ton of different barrel lengths. You have a 10 and a half inch SBR or pistol, and that's gonna have a carbine length gas system on it. They also have the 14 and a half inch pin welded version that I have right here, and this one has a mid length gas system on it. They also have a 16 inch barrel, which has a mid length gas system on it. And then they have a weird number, which is a 17 and a half inch rifle that has an intermediate length gas system on it. Kind of interesting, never seen that before. It also comes in a ton of different colors. Comes in Radian Black, Radian Gray, which is the version that I have right here, Radian Brown, Radian OD Green, and Flat Dark Earth. All of them are Cerakoted, and none of them have any of that hard coat anodizing on them, but they did a phenomenal job on the Cerakote, at least with mine. For muzzle devices, you get two choices. You can either get a Silenced Co ASR, or you can get the Dead Air Flash Hider, which has the chemo mount on it, and it is a three prong flash hider, which is the one that I chose to get for myself. Now the triggers on these look very unique, but in fact, they're not very unique. Essentially, they're rebranded Timney triggers that have a Radian shoe on them. Currently for their triggers, they offer two shoes. They offer a flat shoe and a curved shoe. However, when you go to the rifle configurator, it only allows you to choose the curved shoe. We'll talk more about the trigger when we get into the pros and cons, but I just wanted to mention that very briefly. The stock and grip come with a Magpul K2 grip and a Magpul CTR stock. Now, the other thing about this is it has most of the hallmarks that you'd see on a higher end rifle. Most higher end rifles, especially ones that come with government contracts, typically have two barrel dimples, and this one does as well. They typically have a very strong handguard that not only resists resist slipping off in this direction, but also resist rotation. Some of the government contract guns are fully ambi, not all of them, but this one is. This one has a properly state gas key with aux screws on it. it. Has a properly state castle nut, upgraded end plate with a QD mount on it. it. Has an upgraded ambidextrous safety selector that is either 45 degrees or 90 degrees, whichever way you want to do it. Has an upgraded ambidextrous charging handle, upgraded takedown pins, and a QD muzzle device. Now that's all fine and dandy, but what makes this thing special beyond typical government contract guns? Well, the first thing is going to be the ADAC lower. And ADAC stands for ambidextrous dual action controls. Essentially, your magazine release right here that drops the mag doubles as your bolt lock. Like that which can take some getting used to, but let's do a little bit of a run where we compare, say, clearing a malfunction and reloading with the ADAC versus a standard ambi lower versus a non-ambi lower. All right, so for this portion of the video, we are gonna be using snap caps. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna simulate a malfunction and that we need to clear the malfunction using a non-ambi gun, ambi gun, and then the ADAC, just to kind of show you the difference. So if we pretend we're shooting and then we had a malfunction, well, first we're gonna drop the mag, then we gotta break our grip, lock the bolt open. You know, you're checking your chamber, you're gonna reload and come back out like that. If you're actually in a situation where you need to get that done in a hurry, it would look more like this. Now, don't judge too harshly, I'm not an expert. Bang, 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 oh crap, got a malfunction. And then you're back. So on this gun, we have ambi controls, we have an ambi bolt lock, bolt release, and it looks almost identical on the other side of the gun as well. Bang, 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 oh crap, malfunction, cool. and then you're back up. It's a lot easier and you don't gotta break the grip of your gun. So let's do the same thing with the ADAC. Bang, 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 crap, malfunction. It's a lot faster because there's only one button that you have to press for both the mag release and to lock the bolt. Well, there went the dummy round. And to lock the bolt open versus there's a couple of different presses with the standard ambi lower. This gun operates the same exact way on the whether you're right-handed or whether you're left-handed. However, the left-handed magazine release has a stiffer spring 
than the right-handed side. You're gonna have to have a very strong finger in order to lock that open. So when I press that, you see it's not locking. But if I press it harder with my thumb, you can see that it is. At first, I thought that was a flaw, but it turns out that that's a feature. So if you have this gun on a sling and you're running a chest rig and this thing's bouncing off of your kit, you don't want the magazine release to get hit and drop a mag. I'm sure if you're a left-handed shooter and you use this a lot and run that side a lot, that spring will break in a little bit, but it is very stiff. Another thing that this gun has that a lot of government contract guns don't have is upgraded controls and an upgraded trigger. Something else that's more upgraded than standard government contract guns is it has an upgraded buffer tube. The buffer tube is actually, it looks like it's a primary weapon systems fluted and numbered buffer tube. Not that it's the biggest deal in the world, but it, when you, you're paying this kind of a price for a gun, it's nice to see that they've upgraded a ton of stuff on here to kind of make it worth the money. Another thing that they've done that a lot of other companies don't do, I've only seen it from one other company, which is Aero Precision, is on the top of the rail here, here, there's actually no gap between the upper and the handguard. It's a continuous Picatinny rail. And that's important just in case you have a type of optic that might mount right where that seam is. Otherwise, it's not the biggest deal in the world, but it is something that just takes it a little bit further than where other companies are doing. The barrel on here is a match grade 416R stainless steel that has a polished crown and polished feed ramps. As I mentioned earlier, they also have a sub MOA guarantee using Black Hills ammunition. I believe it's a 77 grain ammo that you have to use to, in order to get that. Interestingly enough, over on the Radian website, there's actually not a ton of information about their barrel which kind of sucks because I like to know, you know, are the barrels high pressure tested or magnetic particle inspected? But as we saw with the Golden Web's full auto burndowns, this thing went the most rounds for a factory gun. The barrel didn't break and almost every other gun that had a cold hammer forged barrel failed faster. So it's kind of interesting that a stainless steel gun did that. I wish I knew more about it, but unfortunately on their website, they don't have that much info about it. Another interesting feature on this lower is going to be the proprietary trigger pin. You can see on one side, the end of the trigger pin is more of an oval shape than a round shape. I don't know how I feel about proprietary trigger pin because maybe you want to change out the trigger for something else. What if you lose it? And then you got to contact them and I don't see them on their website available. I'm sure that they have replacements if you call them and stuff like that, but that's kind of a pain in the butt. Now, interestingly enough, the barrel nut has a ton of different holes in it. And the holes are used for dissipating heat out away from the barrel. Moving up is their gas block. Now the gas block is their own gas block. But what I found interesting about this gas block is it uses a notch on the gas block and then right there at the shoulder of the barrel, it locks into place. And that does a couple of different things. Number one, every time you lock that into that spot, you are in perfect alignment with your gas port. Additionally, on the bottom of the barrel, it does have two dimples for the set screws on the gas block. But what's interesting about it is I noticed on one of the screws, it's more elongated and then the second screw is just more of a hole. I don't know what that does, but it is interesting. I've never seen that before. So now that I've kind of flooded your brain with just various product knowledge, how the heck does this thing even shoot? I do wanna give a big shout out to the boys over at Scottsdale Gun Club for allowing me to use their indoor range. It got extremely hot this summer and I just could not shoot outdoors. So big thank you to those guys. And I wanted to give a big shout out to Badlands Ammo for hooking us up with ammo for the testing in this video. I do have some info about them over at the parts list, wink, wink. So be sure to check that out. But in regards to the ADAC system itself, in regards to clearing malfunctions, I, ne I wasn't able to actually test this in the field because I never had a single malfunction. I'm a little bit over 500 rounds right now through the rifle and just didn't have a malfunction. So all of the ADAC testing that I did, as you saw earlier, just with dry fire. Additionally, in regards to reliability, I tried it with a bunch of different types of mags. I tried it with Lancer mags. I tried it with P mags and some other stuff and everything ran flawlessly. The recoil impulse on this is amazing. It shoots fast. It shoots very flat. It, the muzzle doesn't rise when you're trying to shoot it very quickly. Now, in regards to accuracy, I have not had a chance to do any sub MOA testing on here. However, I took this into the backyard 
yard, I did a boresight laser zero. I believe it was a hundred yard zero, but you could do it at 75 feet. And then like you place the reticle on one dot and then a laser hits the other dot. I didn't even go out to confirm that zero. It was literally the last day before it got too hot for us to shoot outside. I just went to the desert real quick, had some different targets set up at different distances. And this is what happened. Now those different targets were about two foot squares at various distances. So that doesn't prove that this thing's sub MOA accurate or anything like that. But for a bore sight zero that I didn't adjust later, just running out to the desert, just figuring out what my point of aim point of impact was, it was very consistent even when the barrel got hot. So let's get into the things that I don't like about this gun. Number one, the trigger. Now on my particular Radian Model 1, the trigger is actually really good. I'm able to shoot this incredibly fast. The downside to this type of trigger is if your gun isn't perfectly gassed, it is very easy to outrun. I have this exact same trigger in my BCM rifle, and then I also have it in a shield arms build that I'm doing right now, and I have the flat version. And in both of those guns, when I first started testing it, I had to adjust the weight of the buffer because I kept outrunning the trigger, and it was super annoying. I think you are, dude. Yeah, I'm out running this trigger. Same trigger. <laughs> the second thing I don't like about the trigger is they seem to be kind of inconsistent. And what I mean by that is between my flat trigger and the curve trigger, they have drastically different trigger pull weights. The curve triggers that I have both pull at about four pounds. The flat trigger that I have pulls at about five pounds. It feels like it's a little bit heavy. Now, each trigger is consistent in its own pull, but I'm just saying when you compare them against other triggers from in other guns, they seem to pull at different weights. Kind of a bummer. The next thing I don't like about the trigger is the reset is kind of weak. It leaves a lot to be desired. Now, with that said, this trigger is miles ahead of any of your mil spec triggers that you're gonna have, or even a mil spec plus trigger. But I will say, as of right now, in my humble opinion, I don't feel like the trigger is worth it unless you get the complete gun because the complete gun is gassed perfectly and you're not gonna outrun the trigger. The second thing that I don't like is the handguard. The handguard's not that bad. Don't get me wrong, the handguard's actually quite nice. However, I wish that the M-Lock was seven-sided instead of just three-sided. Similar to that, that's on the Geisley Super Duty or even on the Blackout Defense. I like having M-Lock everywhere. That way, if I have an attachment on the gun, I don't have to go out and buy a special mount. I can just use whatever mounts I have if they don't fit in a certain position. It just gives you more options. And whenever you're spending that kind of money, you want the most options that you can possibly get. The second thing that I don't like about this handguard, and this is gonna be the same thing for Blackout Defense, is they don't have an integrated quick detach on the handguard. And specifically, I'm not talking about a quick detach sling point that's like this. I'm talking about a quick detach sling point that looks like this where there is a steel reinforcement inside of it and the reason i say that there's a lot of more affordable guns that have that this is the psa 308 that i just got it has the reinforced quick detach the x2 dev group gun i haven't reviewed this yet that is coming it has a reinforced quick detach now i get it it's not the biggest deal in the world you can go out and you can buy like the reinforced qd sling points that go onto the m-lock section but 
it would be nice if it was just integrated when you're spending this amount of money on the gun. And for reference, these guns are over 3,000 bucks. I think when you're spending that amount of money, you shouldn't have to go out and do stuff like that. The third thing that I don't like about this gun is the butt stock. I don't like Magpul CTR stocks. I feel like these are some of the cheapest stocks that you can throw on a gun. And the reason I say that is number one, you have zero cheek weld to speak of. Number two, you have a ton of rattle. See what I mean? I mean, they could have done something like a Magpul SL stock, zero rattle. Now I understand as a company that it can be hard to try to find a stock that everyone is gonna like. All I'm saying is just get a stock that just isn't as rattly and has a little bit more of a cheek weld like this Magpul SL or even a B5 systems. I mean, all these stocks essentially cost the same amount of money anyway. So you might as well throw something that's a little bit nicer on it. And not only that, but I feel like with this gun, everything on here is incredibly tight and all the tolerances are tight until you get to the stock. And I just don't feel like the, this stock matches the brand of having tight tolerances that Radian is all about. My next criticism is gonna be with the bolt carrier group. Bolt carrier groups, 9310, it's nitrided. With nitrided bolt carrier groups, it's kind of a double-edged sword. We're not gonna go into all the details on it because I've got a video that's dedicated to that. But the downside to nitrided bolt carrier groups is the heat that's needed to create the nitriding is very close to the heat that's needed for the heat treating. And if those temperatures aren't closely watched, when they go to nitride it, they could actually make the bolt more brittle in the process. Now, if it's done correctly, it can be a superior coating and it can have superior strength, but the QC is super important on that. And that's the other thing with 9310, if it's heat treated improperly, it becomes way more brittle than Carpenter 158. Why it bothers me that these bolts aren't high pressure tested. They are magnetic particle inspected, but they're not high pressure tested. Another thing that bothers me about it is they're not chrome lined. Don't get me wrong, the bolt carrier group has ran fine for me. And in fact, in the burn down test, it seemed to run fine for them. I feel like if you're gonna be charging a premium for a rifle, you should have some of the best specs ever on the bolt carrier group. Next thing that I don't like about the Radian Model 1 is I feel like that you should be able to have more customizations when you wanna order one. You're gonna wait about eight or nine months to get one of these when you place an order. I wish that they would allow you to do different colors and not just like the different colors that they have. I wish they would allow you to mix and match the colors between like the handguard, the upper and the lower, just in case that's something you're into. I wish they had more options for the muzzle devices, especially for the pin weld, because with a pin weld, you're stuck with that muzzle device. Yes, technically a gunsmith can take that off, but it's not guaranteed that they'll be able to get that off without screwing up the threads of the rifle. And then if that happens, you're gonna need a whole new barrel. So I wish if they didn't offer different muzzle devices, they would give you the option to send in the muzzle device that you want to get pinned and welded. And the reason that I bring up those two cons about mixing matching colors and doing muzzle devices is that's what Blackout Defense does. If you guys didn't watch my video on that, this is one of my favorite rifles that I've ever had. And although this one isn't fully ambi, like the Radian. This one has a ton of crazy technology in it. And I've actually taken this thing out to a thousand yards. And this is a 39 inch barrel. And I was hitting steel with a 15, 20 mile an hour crosswind. Oh, <laughs> hit with a 13. That's a solid fucking 15 mile an hour wind right there. Oh, <laughs> yes. Are you filming? 13.9 on a tripod. We're at 9.50. Nice. We'll make a full video on that here in the very near future because I need to get that video done. Now that I got those criticisms out of the way, on paper, when you look at this rifle, it doesn't seem like anything much more special than say the Geisley Super Duty or the Daniel Defense. However, when you get the complete rifle, it becomes something that's more than the sum of its parts. Because they take so much care in their quality control and in their machining processes, the gun turns out to be something to be more than what you expected. When they put this gun together in its final form, at least from the factory, you get a gun that has a sub MOA guarantee that's outperforming all of these other 
high-end rifles by a long margin. It's outperforming them in full auto test and in accuracy. And that is a lot to ask for in a rifle because typically you either get a sub MOA gun that you can't shoot very fast, it doesn't last as long, or you get a battle proven rifle that doesn't have sub MOA accuracy. And I will say they seem to pull it off very well. Now, if you're watching this video and you're saying to yourself, man, I'd love to have something like that. But at the end of the day, man, 3,100 bucks is just way too much money. Well, the good news is there are options for you. And it really depends on what you want out of your rifle. Now, just FYI, everything we're about to talk about will be over at the parts list. That way you can find it. Now, let's say you like this rifle and you're like, man, I don't want to go spend 3,100 bucks. I don't like that stock. I don't like that grip. I don't like that trigger or that bolt carrier group. Well, actually you can do something almost identical with all of those things with something different and it comes out cheaper. Here's what I mean. With the Radiant, you can buy the stripped lower. Now with the stripped lower, it actually comes with all of the parts of the lower receiver aside from the grip and the trigger and one of the trigger pins. It even comes with the safety selector. You can also get these as complete uppers with the charging handle and the bolt carrier group. So you could take something like a complete upper, strip lower. You could do like a Bravo Company stock, Bravo Company grip, maybe either like a Geisley Super Duty trigger or even my favorite, the Blackout Defense trigger. And you could get all of that. And if you use Radian's bolt carrier group, it comes out to 28, 2900 bucks. If you choose to replace that bolt carrier group, it comes out to like almost 3100 bucks. Literally the same price as this guy, but with different pieces that you might want to have on the gun. If you're the kind of person that's like, dude, I just want something that's rugged and ambi, but I don't really care about sub MOA accuracy. Well, you could do something like a Geisley Super Duty. You can actually get these as build kits where it comes with everything minus the lower receiver. And you could actually get the Radiant ADAC lower. Then you would have a gun that's not only gonna be very, very reliable that came in second place in the full auto test from the Golden Web channel, but you'll also have something that's fully ambi with that ADAC. And that would come out to about, you know, 2,300-ish, like almost a thousand bucks less than the Radian Model 1. There's also a lot of other configurations that I'm not gonna go into in the video, but I'll have more explanations available over at the parts list, just in case you wanna check those out. But there is ways to get 90% of what this offers for like 70% of the price. However, at the end of the day, the gun has ran perfectly well for me, at least with the sample size that I have. It's easy to shoot fast, it's easy to shoot flat, and it's easy to be super accurate with it. Can you do that with other guns that are cheaper? Absolutely. This is a gun that I would save my money for and buy one just to kind of have it because I think it's amazing, but it's not gonna be the gun that you absolutely have to have. I think it's worth the money because of how well it performs, but it's not gonna be for everybody. I'm not telling you to go buy this. I'm not telling you not to go buy this. If you wanna have an idea of what else you can get for a lesser price, and I highly recommend you go check out this video right here because you might be a little bit blown away. So let me know if you guys have any questions or suggestions down in the comment section. I'll do my best to reply to you guys. But until next time, guys, I love you and you guys stay sexy.